So, uh, Joel, are you ready? Okay, thank you. Um, members, it is uh, February 18th at uh, 2.01 p.m. Uh, I'd like to call to order the uh, House Finance and Policy Committee. Uh, first, I'd like to apologize for our tardiness. Uh, we have two bills up today. Um, and and uh, I'm gonna turn over the gavel to uh, Senator Duckworth. And, and uh, so he's aware I do have an author's amendment, a technical fix. So, so with that, uh, uh, Senator Duckworth, uh, you're the chair. Uh, well, thank you, sir. We'll go ahead and continue on. And just so everybody knows, we do have a hard stop at 2.45 today. So we're gonna work hard to do uh, as much work as we can in the time allotted. Uh, so Senator Dreheim, I understand you have uh, Senate file 912 before, so that you have an author's amendment to offer as well. Correct, Chair. I have uh, the A1 amendment, a technical fix. Thank you. And I don't know if you need to move uh, to have your bill be heard or if it's, since it's going to be held over, we can just go right into discussion. So, Actually, Chair, um, we have another stop on this. So we are going to have to pass it out of committee okay. um, to uh, local government. So local government is the next stop for, for this bill. Uh, very good. So would you like to uh, uh, make a, a motion that uh, recommends Senate file 912 be passed on, re-referred to the Senate Local Government Policy Committee? So moved. Thank you. All those in favor, please respond with aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Very good. Uh, Senator Dreheim, I'll turn it over to you to introduce your bill. Um, I, I think first we should adopt the A1 amendment. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, adopt the A1 amendment. At this time, all those uh, in favor of adopting the amendment, please respond with aye. 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 All those opposed, please respond with nay. Hearing none, the amendment is adopted. Uh, Senator Dreheim, I'll turn it over to you to introduce your bill. Thank you. Uh, today, uh, members, we have, thank you, Chair. Um, we have a, uh, a Bill 912 that closes a, a loophole um, prohibiting prohibiting rent control. And we, we already have uh, a statute 471.9996 that deals with that. This is modifying that and, and eliminating part of the subsection two. Um, but uh, Chair, I would like to go to the test fires because I know we're short on time. And uh, if we could start with, um, I, I believe uh, Mr. Smith is here. Very good. Uh, Mr. Smith, please, when you're ready. I thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Dreheim, and committee members. My name is Cecil Smith. I am president and CEO of the Minnesota Multi Housing Association, representing 1,800 members and 400,000 housing units in Minnesota. I'm also an owner and operator of apartments in Minneapolis. Hello. I appreciate the opportunity. Dr. Kotia. 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 I, I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support. I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of Senate File 912. Minnesota needs a complete and absolute statewide preemption of rent control. Local governments have been prohibited for 37 years from enacting rent control, except for a very narrow exception. We have had nearly 40 more years of data and analysis to affirm that rent control policies, including rent stabilization, do not work, and hence the necessity of Senate File 912. Rent control is a disastrous policy. A summary of the academic and empirical research on rent control finds the following significant takeaways. Rent control laws can reduce the available supply of quality rental housing. The research suggests that rental property owners were induced to convert their properties into condominiums or not to renovate or even maintain their rental properties. Rent control policies can lead to higher rents in the uncontrolled market. Under rent control, rents are often higher than would be expected without rent control. While housing units that are subject to rent control have rents that are lower than market rents, the broader impact that these policies have on housing supply causes all other renters to pay more. If individual cities were to implement rent control, then renters in neighboring cities might bear more of a housing cost burden. Residents of rent control units 
are less geographically and economically mobile. The benefit of living in a rent-controlled unit can cause renters to remain in their units longer than they would without rent control, leading to a mismatch in unit type and size given the particular need of the household. The impact of this issue is that renters become tied to their units, rather leading to less geographic and ultimately economic mobility and a misallocation of housing resources among household sizes. Rent control policies do a poor job of targeting benefits. While some low-income families do benefit from rent control, at least initially, higher income households also benefit from rent increase reductions. There are more efficient and effective ways to assist lower income individuals and families who have trouble finding housing they can afford. In some ways, though not intended, rent control benefits an initial group of renters at the expense of others, since the costs and effects are borne by future renters many years later as they face housing shortages, higher rents, and lower quality housing. Mr. Chair, you will hear arguments uh, on this matter that there are new and improved approaches to rent control. That is the approach Oregon took in 2019. But in the first three months following Oregon's rent cap passage, CoStar recorded that investments in the multi -rate, mul market, rate, market rate, sorry, multifamily buildings declined 38% from the same period one year earlier, representing a loss of $120 million of investment in one quarter alone. I personally experienced this effect last week. A West Coast institutional investor looking at a large investment opportunity in a South Metro suburb reached out to me personally and questioned me at length about rent stabilization proposals circulating in Minneapolis. They were reopening their due diligence on the investment for they were very apprehensive about these policies and their potential exposure. Minnesota needs every investment dollar in housing that we can find. We need to do everything to attract investment in our housing infrastructure, and rent control is proven to have the opposite effect. Mr. Chair, thank you for this opportunity. I would urge adoption of Senate File 912. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I appreciate it. And uh, Senator Dreheim, I understand there's another testifier, Mr. Paul Eager. Uh, if that's correct and he's with us, Mr. Eager, go ahead when you're ready. Uh, Mr. Chair, my name is Paul Egger, and I'm Vice President of Governmental Affairs for the Minnesota Realtors Association. Minnesota Realtors is a statewide business trade association with a membership of over 21,000 real estate professionals working with buyers and sellers of all types of property in every corner of the state. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of Senate File 912. With the current law exception to the prohibition on rent control, the possibility exists that local rent control policies could be implemented and which, if enacted, we believe would adversely affect property owners and reduce the quality and quantity of housing opportunities. We need more housing, and we need more types of housing to meet demand. Rent control policies, however, create disincentives to invest in the construction of new rental properties, rehabilitate existing properties, and convert buildings from non-residential to residential use. Rent control policies also make it more likely that affordable rental properties could be converted, converted into condominiums or some other use, further exacerbating the housing availability issue. In addition, policies limiting a property owner's ability to set rent at a level the market can support may result in many not having the resources to reinvest in their properties or even meet routine ongoing maintenance expenses. Mr. Chair, more housing of all types and at all price points is what we need to better meet consumer demand and to achieve a market that is balanced between landlords and tenants and buyers and sellers. We look forward to partnering with you and other members of the legislature as you move towards that goal. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. And then uh, Senator Dreheim will go ahead and entertain some questions before you give your closing remarks. Any questions for any of the testifiers or Senator Dreheim? All right, not seeing any hands raised. So Senator Dreheim, oh, excuse Senator me, Senator Dietzik, go ahead. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, sorry about that. I couldn't find the raise hand button quick enough. Um, so, I mean, I noticed that League of Cities and Metro Cities and some others are against it. Um, I haven't actually heard from my city, but I'm assuming they're against it. 
Um, but I, I, I'm just going to put out on the record that I do have questions for my city because they, and it's not totally related to the, this bill, but it's part of the underlying um, probably discussion. And, you know, they did the 2040 plan, which was to, you know, provide more rental opportunities and more housing opportunities for people. And so I don't know how rent control would impact that. I don't know what the difference between rent control and rent stabilization means. I think we do need to have a discussion on how we help people who can't afford the rents that are out there and how we, um, you know, we do have a lot of people that how do they, you know, they can't afford or can't find housing. And we've had the discussion here and I know um, Chair Dreham agrees that we do need to expand those housing options and we just need more housing across the spectrum. And so how do we help those so that it's not, not just all uh, upper end housing being built. So um, I'm just gonna say uh, I have concerns about this. I don't, I have a lot of unanswered questions on just rent control in general. Um, but because the cities are not for it at this point and I need to learn more, um, I will be voting no. Right, thank you, uh, that's noted. And uh, are there any other, Senator Drehan, did you wanna respond? Yeah, thank you. And uh, uh, thank you for your comments, Senator Dietzik. Um, you, you know, when we, I think we all can agree we have a shortage of housing. And I think we all can agree that rents cost too much for the incomes that we have um, in most areas. Um, but the, the data shows that um, rent control is not the answer. And in fact, um, it, it's been studied quite a bit, you know, rent control started in um, you know, World War II and it's been uh, studied both in New York and in California, so both coasts. And they did a, um, a study of a bunch of economists in the uh, American Econo Economy um, magazine, uh, I think it was 464 economists and 93% of them said that the worst thing you can do for, for housing was rent control. Um, you know, it, it's something that was taught in, in basic uh, economics courses and, and was an example that they gave when I went to school. Um, you know, it, it does cut, rent in the short term, but it encourages people not to build new units. And, and what we need are more units. And I, I think the, the, the question about uh, high-end units versus affordable units is an important one. And that's what we were trying to get done last year with, with all of our um, changes to, to zoning, density, uh, building codes, et cetera, was at the cost because that, that's one of the, the problems that we have is that we, we need to address the cost so we can build cheaper units and then units could be rented out cheaper and we need more of them. So, um, but it's just not one city that would be affected by rent control. Uh, housing is, is regional and um, if, if you have in my district, let's say the small town of La Center puts rent control on, it would bleed over to my other small towns nearby, Lonsdale, you know, New Prague, Montgomery, Kilkenny, or, or, or whatever else is nearby, um, and affect their markets too. So it, it is more of a global picture than just one, one simple city. Uh, so I, I hope members will let this bill move forward on the local government, uh, will, will it will be more scrutinized. Uh, but the, all the economists agree it's the worst thing you can do. It decentivizes new units being built. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Desick. Any uh, additional questions or comments related to that? Um, no, thanks, Senator Drehan. One other thing, I know you've looked into it a lot and I'll be following up um, and looking into more. But another question I have is who does this benefit? Who does rent control benefit and who does limiting rent control benefit? Because I mean, I'll be honest, I have two, and I'm talking quickly because I know we have another bill in limited time. I have two knowledges of uh, rent control and one is from the TV show Friends where, you know, they lived in a rent control unit and, you know, it was their grandma's unit. And so that, you know, they stayed in that unit. And so, you know, is that really helping of who we wanted to help? And then I have another friend whose mother lives in San Francisco in a rent control department. Um, and, 
you know, that helps her, but, you know, I don't know if it has helped San Francisco because they still, you read a lot about how most people can't afford to live there. And so, you know, what is that? I don't know the impact of what that has done to the rest of the rents in the area. Um, you know, I know it helps one person, but maybe not a lot others. So these are just some questions that I hope as we move forward, we continue to get some answers for. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you Sandra Dietzik. It's always hard to counter a point that references such a great show like Friends. <laughs> well, well done. Senator Drehan, did you have a response to that? Yeah, I, I, my daughter will appreciate that, Senator Dietzik. She loves that show, Friends. Um, but you know, I think you bring up a, a great example. And, and in that example, you probably bring up the two biggest extremes, uh, New York and San Francisco, where uh, rent costs and owning costs are the highest in the country. And, and they have probably had the longest rent control of anywhere in, in, in our country. But um, when, when you even look at Europe, even socialist countries that, that have tried rent control, it hasn't worked. So I would, I would argue that it only benefits the, the families for a short time because it doesn't encourage them to move on. And if you have a larger, let's say four bedroom uh, unit for a family, and the family moves out, they're probably gonna stay in that rent controlled apartment. And that would prohibit a, um, a new family from taking over from that empty nesters because of, of the rent control. But it's a supply and demand, basic economics. You're gonna, you're gonna hurt more units being built, like the example that was given by Mr. Smith. Um, you're gonna hurt um, the private, property owners. So this bill only affects private property owners. So if, if a city feels that strongly about this, they can put up their own buildings and do what they want. Uh, this would be for private individuals only, privately owned properties. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Dreheim. Senator Dietzik, anything further? Very good, thank you. Uh, and just a note, um, one of our colleagues, Senator Ress, is trying to join uh, our hearing here. She's having a technology issue. Just wanted to mention that out of, out of respect for her as she tries to get on. Uh, Senator Dames, you have a question or comment, sir? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Draheim. I just was to see if you had any idea. Once this rent control program would go into place in, in the other states that have done this or other cities, I should say, how long does it usually take before you start seeing a severe diminishment in the number of rental units available? In other words, how long is it before the owners of the rental units say, you know what, this is not working and they start selling those units off or, or taking them out of the, the rental inventory? Any idea? Chair? Senator Drahan? No, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, what, what I have read, you know, and, and this bill all came about this summer or fall when, when I saw an article in, in one of the local papers uh, about one of the communities wanting to do this. Um, and, you know, I, I know that new development goes to more of the, the home ownership model, um, which, which is one of our goals, of course. But uh, with rent control, uh, most buildings are condoed instead of apartment. So it would actually increase the cost of the people that we're trying to help. Um, so I, I think it would be pretty immediate affected how how broad that effect is i don't i don't think we know and i did not see anything on the material that i read uh so i don't know if, if mr smith uh, has any comments on that or if, have seen something from his association mr smith anything to add related to that the the only data that i mr chair sorry the only data that i had seen senator dreheim uh was in Oregon, where there was a very measurable effect on um, diminished investment. Now, that didn't immediately correlate to um, production, um, but it was um, a very, very significant pause of capital inflow um, into the Oregon market uh, that was within the first three months. So um, these these policies tend to play out over a longer period of time. Um, and that's the that's the challenge. There's a short term benefit and uh, long term uh, catastrophic effects. Thank you. Uh, Senator Dames, anything further? Uh, no follow up. Okay, any additional questions or comments? 
Very good. Seeing none, Senator Dreha, I'll give you an opportunity to uh, get some closing remarks. You know, I, I'd, I'd really like to get uh, Senator Port's bill. So I would like to move this on to local government and, uh, and, and get her an opportunity to hear her first bill. Perfect. So do you renew your motion? I do renew my motion. Thank you. Excellent. Senator Dreheim renews his motion that as, SF, uh, as amended. Thank you. That SF 912 as amended be recommended to pass and be referred to the state local government policy committee. All those in favor, please respond by aye or give me a thumbs up. Aye. 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 Okay. And all those opposed, please respond with no. Very good, the motion passes and uh, shall be re-referred to uh, Senate Local Government Policy Committee. Uh, now that we can move on, uh, Senator Dreheim, I'll gladly pass the torch back to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Senator Duckworth for helping out again. Um, members, we, we have um, Senator Port and Senator Ress bill, Senate file 889 up. And I understand it is Senator Port's first bill in a hearing. So congratulations, Senator Port. Um, with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chair Dreheim, members of the committee, in recent weeks, we've heard a lot about Minnesota's housing crisis. I fully support increased funding to help meet the housing needs of our community. And implementing Senate File 889 would help to maximize current and future housing investments. This bill would require a minimum of 30 years affordability in exchange for state investments in multifamily housing projects. And just because I know Friends was so successfully invoked in the last bill, it's been 27 years since Friends first premiered. So we would just be getting to the end of that 30 year marker. Um, the goal with this legislation is to help combat and prevent displacement, to stabilize our state's affordable housing market, and to maximize our financial resources. This policy issue has been talked about for a number of years by nonprofit affordable housing developers who commonly keep affordable housing units permanently affordable for the life of the property. Many times this is much longer than even 30 years, as you will hear from some of the comments from testifiers joining me today. This bill in connection with sustainable funding will help to support affordable housing in communities all across the state for the long term. Currently, most of the funding sources administered through Minnesota Housing do require at least 30 years of affordability. However, some only require 15 years. Um, examples of those are tax exempt bonds, the 4% tax credits and historic tax credits. It's my hope that as a committee, we can take steps to help Minnesota solve its affordability crisis. And if this bill is enacted, it could help to ensure that down the road, we won't have to continue to have displacement and scarcity discussions every 10 to 15 years. In recent years, many, if not all of the state's financial tools to produce and preserve affordable housing have been really heavily oversubscribed. And this in particular has been a driver in conversations around support for longer affordability terms from affordable housing advocates. We were gonna be joined today by Barb Janetta, the Executive Director of Alliance Housing and Alan Arthur, President and CEO of Aon to highlight Minnesota's affordable uh, housing needs and their support for this bill. They were unable to join us because we shifted later, but we do have uh, Carrie Johnson from MCCD and Homes for All who will still be testifying in support and she has some of their comments as well. I'm thankful for all of their continued passion and dedication to affordable housing and grateful they were able to take time with us today. Additionally, in the emails that you received prior to committee, there is written testimony provided by Family Housing Fund, Greater Minnesota Housing Fund, and MICA, all in support of this measure. Thank you, Chair and committee members. And if we can now go to Ms. Johnson, and then I'll be happy to stand for questions. Thank you, Senator Port. Uh, Ms. Johnson, good to see you again. Welcome. Please state your name for the record and begin. Uh, thanks, Chair Dreheim, uh, members of the committee. My name is Carrie Johnson. I'm the Senior Policy Advisor at the Metropolitan Consortium of Community Developers, an association of 50 nonprofit organizations committed to expanding the wealth and resources of communities through affordable housing opportunities and economic development initiatives. Um, I also serve as a policy co-chair for the statewide Homes for All Coalition. 
uh, Senator Report mentioned, I wasn't scheduled to testify today, uh, just to be here to answer questions if needed. Uh, but I did pass together testimony from uh, our scheduled testifiers um, and able to convey support for Senate File 889 on behalf of MCCD and Homes for All. Before I get started, uh, I would like to thank Senator Report for carrying this bill and to the chair for uh, holding this hearing. Barb Janetta, uh, the Executive Director of Alliance Housing and Alan Arthur, President and CEO of Aon, were scheduled to testify in favor of expanding longer terms of affordability requirements. Um, but because of the time change, they weren't able to be with us today. A few words from them uh, I'll share now. Alliance Housing and Aon have been in the business of long-term affordable rental apartments for adults and families for over 30 years. Like most nonprofit developers, they intend to still be in this business for a long time to come. As the committee contemplates policy and funding initiatives, we challenge you to keep in mind that public dollars should support public needs and investments, and above all, aim to do no harm, certainly of which displacement uh, causes harm. The passage of this bill will affect only multifamily projects, would clarify internal processes at Minnesota Housing, help maximize the state's investments in affordable housing and provide stability to people living in state-supported affordable housing and the communities they call home. Right now, there simply is not sufficient resources from any of our levels of government to solve the affordable housing crisis that our state is in. Too many very low-income households and low-wage earners can't afford a roof over their head, and so many communities are struggling to meet the housing needs of residents. It seems essential then that government steward all public resources for housing so that they will still benefit these workers for the longest terms possible. The process for acquiring government housing capital is competitive, and there are many um, affordable housing developers that are fully committed to long-term affordability. In the reality, the life of the property, which is often 100 years or more. The resource is too scarce to let a developer turn government capital into profit after only 15 years of affordability. Given the fact that government capital funding is constrained and insufficient to meet the demand, it's imperative that funding awarded of any kind guarantee affordability as long as possible. The state shouldn't be in the business of funding assets for private owners who have no mission of owning and managing affordable housing long-term. It is important to understand that nobody can totally guarantee what the future holds. This is especially true in real estate and affordable housing, but the state does have the opportunity to provide certainty and clarity for Minnesota households and communities with the passage of this bill. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and uh, likewise happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Uh, Senator Port, do you have anything to add before we go to questions? Happy to take questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see Senator Dames has his hand up. Senator Dames. I think you're muted, Senator Dames. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Port. When you drafted this bill, could you tell me uh, who you consulted with? Um, yeah, uh, well, Senator Rest uh, worked on drafting the bill, um, but it was done in consultation uh, in conversation with Minnesota Housing, um, and they contributed to the language in it as well. A follow up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Senator Dames. Did you speak with any private housing providers to get their thoughts and input on this bill? I did not. I am not sure if that happened before I joined the process or not. Um, I can just mention Senator Dames, uh, Carrie Johnson, Johnson. Yeah. the record, um, that uh, affordable housing developers have, uh, nonprofit affordable housing developers have contributed to uh, the drafting of this language. Um, and we did consult with Minnesota Housing, although I know that they would, um, are supportive of a little flexibility in the language, which we're open to should it come to the you know negotiations down the road. Um, as far as uh, private developers, we've not heard any comment. This bill was introduced in the House uh, a couple of years ago as well, and we hadn't heard any comment from them at that time either. Uh, follow up, uh, Mr. Chair? Yeah, Mr. or Senator Dames, go ahead. So, Ms. Johnson, are you indicating then, as long as you didn't hear any follow up from or hear anything from the private market, that that's approval? Is that what I'm hearing? 
Um, I'm just saying I hadn't heard any concerns. I'm absolutely open to having those conversations though. Yeah, I, I think I would suggest you have those conversations with the private market to see where they're really at. Uh, another question, just another follow-up, Mr. Chair, and, and I'm not sure if Senator Porter, Ms. Johnson wants to, rent to answer this, but uh, what kind of rent restrictions would this bill require? Would the rents be frozen? Would they be allowed to go up so much every year? Uh, who sets the amounts? How does that all work? Uh, Senator Thank Port? Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Draymond and Senator Dames. Um, it would require the same uh, sort of restrictions that are under Minnesota housing affordability right now. Um, some of those are in relation to median income. Some of them are restrictions on the amount it can go up each each year. That wouldn't change. It's the same as, as the restrictions that are in place for each type of bond or, or loan at this time. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Dames. Um, Senator Port, could you tell me what they currently are? Uh, it, I think it depends. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Mr. Chair. No, um, yeah, I think that depends on, as I understand it, on what the loan is, what the bond is in that time. Uh, some of them are 60% of AMI. Some of them uh, are, diff are different than that. And how does the rent fluctuate? Senator Port? I believe, again, that depends on the type of, of bond that is issued and the type of, of credit that's issued as well. Could you give me an example, please? I Senator do Port? not have an example. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have no further questions. Thank you, Senator Dames and Senator Port. Uh, Senator Dietzik. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Port and Ms. Johnson. I, I do like this bill. I think it's a good discussion. I think that they said, you know, they have, um, you know, that, you know, they're open to having some flexibility in, in these discussions with some groups as we move forward. Um, Cause I think, I think that is good. But so this is my 10th session in the legislature. And I look at how that time flew by and anybody who has raised kids understands how quickly, you know, 15 years flies by. And so to have, to have it at 15 years, when we put state dollars in there, I mean, that time that time flies just boom and it's 15 years. And so I think having a 30 years allows for a little more better stability and um, a better investment for our state dollars as we try to figure out what it is. And so um, I like the 30 years and um, I hope we continue having the discussions and um, you know, hear more about what others' concerns are and how we can fix it. Because I think the bottom line is we need to, we need to keep these um, units that are affordable, affordable. And that is both in the Metro and in greater Minnesota. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Dietzik. Any comment to that port or Senator Port? Otherwise I do have a question. No, go ahead. I, okay. I know we're getting um, close on time. So yeah. Yep. Um, so I, I always thought that, uh, and I don't know if anybody from the agency is here that could add it to the discussion. But I always thought the the affordability was tied to the length of the bond. So if if it was a, a 15 year bond, it, they were locked in for 15 years of affordability, and then if it was a 20 year bond, it was locked into a 20 year affordability. Uh, is there anybody from the agency that could weigh in on this discussion? Joel, do you know if anybody's on? Um. I know Ryan Baumtrack from the agency had planned on attending, but I don't see him on the call right now. Yeah, Chair, Dame, uh, Chair Draymond, I think he was going to be able to be on earlier, but wasn't able at this time. Okay. I'm okay. happy to follow up with him though and, and get back to you on that. Yeah, because I, I think that that would be, you know, is, is there a, a product available for the bond market and what, what's the fiscal cost uh, of a, a 30 year versus a, a 15 or a 20 year. And, and I know they have a bunch of different programs. Um, so that, that I, I guess would be a big concern of mine. Uh, so I think it's something we can uh, maybe follow up on and uh, have more discussion because we are laying this bill over. So unless anybody else has any information on that subject. I could provide just a little more clarity. Chair sure, Ms. Johnson, go ahead. Thanks, Chair Dreheim um, and committee members. I just want to say that um, 
I'm not an expert in the financing, uh, putting together financing strings either. Oftentimes uh, the structures encompass like 13 to 15 different funding streams in order to make an affordable housing project um, complete to, to go forward, to, to break ground. Um, but just want to say this would put covenants essentially on the property. So they would be affordable for 30 years. Maybe the financing is for 15. They would go back to the state to refinance or get refinancing to um, uh, help come up with any so, um, funding to support maintenance that needs to be done on the property, heating systems, elevators, the roof, windows, things like that. Um, so the goal is essentially to make sure that these properties even if it is a 15 uh, fund, 15 year funding stream that they come back um, and are guaranteed for 30 years of portability. And then um, Minnesota Housing has done some research in the past that um, it takes about 40 years for a new development to become naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, so obviously 30 years is closer to that time frame than 15 years. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate the comments, uh, Ms. Johnson, and uh, we are almost out of town. I want time. I want to make sure that uh, Senator Port, uh, if, Senator Dietzik, do you have any more questions? With with your, I see your hand still up. So, um, Senator Port, any closing comments? Just really quickly, thank you, Mr. Chair and members, for your thoughtful conversation around this topic. I'm pleased that this committee has a shared desire to find solutions to the affordable housing crisis, and I believe this is one of the tools that could help us towards that goal. By requiring the 30-year affordability, we help protect the state's investments in affordable housing, much like we expect bonding investments for libraries or food banks to be maintained for that original purpose. And we know preserving naturally uh, occurring affordable housing is really a challenge, and this policy would help us to ensure that we're investing our limited resources in the most targeted way possible. And I thank the committee for its time. Thank you, uh, Senator Port. Uh, very good job. Um, we are going to lay this bill over. And uh, members, I, I like to finish on time, if not early. And I, I guess we buzzed through both those bills quite quite early. Uh, we will continue next week with some more uh, housing bills. Uh, but members, please turn on your camera and, and uh, unmute yourselves. I guess, I'm sorry, we don't need to do that. We're gonna lay it over. So we'll lay over Senate file 889 uh, for possible inclusion in the uh, housing omnibus bill. Sorry, I got excited there. I thought we could vote again. So um, members with that, if, if uh, nothing else, we, we will see you next week. Uh, everybody have a good weekend. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.